Oh, hi, everyone. This is Dr. Epstein. I'm here to discuss hairline lowering as well as um, hair grafting or addressing overly high hairlines in females. Um, I'm Dr. Jeff Epstein. I'm not Stacy Harrison. I'm using Stacy's account. She um, helped me set this up. I'm only going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then answer questions. I'd like to share a, um, a video or a PowerPoint presentation that I just made while in um, Las Vegas um, at the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery meeting. I'm going to take me to the PowerPoint presentation. I'll just allow you to understand a little more about this hairline lung surgery versus the option, as I said, which was hair grafting. So let me go ahead and start my share screen sharing. So anyway, this was a, a meeting or a lecture I presented at the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery annual meeting last two weeks ago in Las Vegas. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about these two surgery surgical options. I have nothing to disclose, and I'm on faculty at the University of Miami. Basically, there's two techniques for lowering the overly high female hairline. First is hair grafting, which is what most people are familiar with. The other one is hairline lowering forehead reduction surgery. And they're both effective techniques that each have their indications and their advantages and disadvantages. So with hair grafting, you can see a typical example before and after, obviously a beautiful result, 2,300 grafts. So it didn't just lower the hairline, but it also rounded it out. Another example where we not only lowered it, but also rounded out, another, once again, another patient that chose to go with hair grafting, 2,500 grafts. And hair transplantation most commonly consists of the FUE approach, where we, um, where we go ahead and harvest the hairs um, and um, one at a time. And, uh, and then we get these little grafts which you can see in this dish that contain, in this case, two hairs and three hairs. And these hairs are then transplanted into tiny recipient sites. And this is a case of a gentleman, but we have a four person system after the recipient sites are made, you can see how the grafts are planted. And it's a, it's by necessity, it, it needs to be a, an efficient process because in a single procedure, we're literally transplanting 2,000 as many as 2,800 grafts, if not more in a single procedure. And here's more examples before and after with hair grafting and another example of hair grafting primarily to round out the hairline. And the indications for hair grafting is just if an individual has active progressive hair loss, because we don't want to do hairline bone surgery and they continue to lose hair, as opposed to grafting, once those hairs are placed, they're going to be permanent. We also requires some degree of scalp mobility. If there's not good mobility, it's not possible to go ahead and do the a hairline lung surgery. If they've had a prior scalp surgery, particularly a brow lift, not along the hairline, but further back, that would compromise circulation. And many of our patients um, desire more rounding than advancing. So if they're actually looking for lowering, that's a good indication for the hairline lung surgery. But if they're primarily looking for rounding out, yes, grafting is probably the answer. And of course, it's less surgery, and finally, there are not a lot of surgeons that know how to do both these procedures. There's a couple of plastic surgeons that specialize like me in doing hairline lung surgery. And there's a ton of surgeons or doctors that specialize in hair grafting, but they can't offer um, hair line lung surgery. And I'm able to offer both because I specialize in both. And this is the sort of result we can achieve with hairline lowering, also called forehead reduction surgery. In this case, 25 millimeters of lowering Basically, the results are instantaneous. You can see immediately post-op uh, the very same day. And here, um, lowering it by a little over an inch is the equivalent of around 6,000 grafts or around 12,000 hairs, which would be unsurpassed or, or impossible, I should say, with grafting in one procedure. It would, would require two procedures done eight, eight to 10 months apart to get this sort of density. And finally, here's another example before and eight months after. And I'll move this. You can see essentially these fine line scar. Some patients get grafting afterwards to help round out the hairline, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And another example before and after 30 millimeters of lowering. And another example before and after another around three centimeters, a little over an inch. 
And it can be effective in certain men, those that have a very stable hairline with no risk of male, developing male pattern hair loss. And you can see in this gentleman a before and after. Anyway, it's a surgical procedure that advances the entire frontal hairline. It requires a mobile scalp and stable dense hairline. It's usually done under general anesthesia, it takes around 90 minutes, creates immediate results. And then if desired down the road, hair grafting can be performed. And this is the test we do. Many of my patients come from out of town, so they will go ahead and send a video showing the um, the lowering uh, using their fingers or when they are in my office, I'll go ahead and do that or they'll do a video or a webcam. But here you can see the results that can be achieved. In this case, I anticipate, I anticipate lowering the hairline by around two and a half centimeters. And here is here is the uh, an, an animated version of the discussion. And I'm going to put this on hold for a second while I take care of my family and dogs. Um, I'm back. I was showing this video here. Straining the laxity. Of course, this is not done in the operating room. This is done ahead of time. And then you can see that once the patient's asleep, the scalp incision is made. Patient's once again asleep, small incision in the back. And this allows me to basically free up the entire scalp. And I go all the way back to the very back of the head using some specially designed instruments that I've, you know, have basically my own instruments. And then we're stretching the scalp forward, seeing how far we can move it. And then sometimes I'll do what's called a galeotomy, which loosens the scalp a little more. It's a very delicate incision. There's really very little bleeding in the surgery, believe it or not, even though it is scalp surgery. And once again, I'll pull in tightly. And then this is one of the key steps is the insertion of what's called these endotines, these little hooks, which are going to, which can be palpable for the first couple of months. What if a patient presses down, but this is what's going to hold the scalp forward. And then essentially the scalp is brought forward and secured to the endotines. And then I can remove and it's secured and I can remove all this excess forehead skin, holding up a little bit. I can pull, even do a full brow lift. I can also contour the, 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 the frontal bone or the forehead bone if a patient wants a little less uh, prominence of the, um, of the bony area to smooth out the hair, to smooth out the forehead. And basically, it's a double layer closure. And the nice thing is because there's the end of times holding the scalp forward, it's going to stay in place and also is not going to pull on the scar. So you get really a fine line scar. And this is just to show the design. So I round out the hairline. You can see the blue line and the purple is where the hairline is going to be is going to be brought forward to. And here's a is a at eight days the stitches get removed. And as I said, you can do a brow lift. I can do a frontal bone reduction. Um, and then make some of the patients around 15 or 20% will have hair grafting after the surgery. And hair grafting is mainly done to round out the hairline and occasionally there's a visible scar. It's typically done after the hairline lowering surgery, not done at the same time, but usually three months later. And another gentleman before and after four months later, guy cuts his hair short, no issues. And six months after, before and after. And hairline lowering surgery can be done for patients that have had prior transplants that are unhappy with the work done. I see some patients like this where I can actually cut out the entire area that's transplanted, take the original hairline, bring it down. Also for some patients with frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is a scarring alopecia, can be effective. This is an example of a woman 18 months earlier. She had had transplants, obviously done elsewhere, and obviously was unhappy with the results. And basically, I was able to remove all that scarred skin and bring her hairline forward. And you can see the before and the after with beautiful density and a natural result. And also can be done to excise, in this case, um, prior, prior plug grafts. I excised all this scarred skin and left the fine line closure. Um, and then for surgery for FFA or frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is a, a scarring alopecia related to rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma, but the disease has to be inactive. And in the problem with doing hair transfers, many times they won't fully regrow. So what I'll do is um, I will excise all this, you know, all that scar tissue and bring the hairline forward. And you can see one example of a woman that had grafting done, not a very good result in the area of frontal fibrosing alopecia. So in her case, I was able to advance her hairline and um, remove all the scarring 
anyway, the surgical airline advancement, uh, the take home points has a high patient satisfaction. I do around four or five of these every, every week. Um, most of my patients fly in, can fly home literally the very next day and be presentable. It's a little discomfort, some discomfort that first night, usually by the first or second day, there's really minimal discomfort. But once again, with the hairs brushed forward, the patient can be presentable. Um, the stitches get removed a week later. I have doctors all throughout the country, including New York, LA, Atlanta, name a city. I may even have a colleague that can take out sutures, London. Um, anyway, um, it has unsurpassed density, the hairline lung surgery uh, with 6,000 plus hair grafts. And as I said, hair grafting can, if desired, be done as soon as three months later. Um, and the risk of complications when done properly can be minimized. And I happen to see a lot of these hairline lung surgery patients that were unhappy with their prior work because it wasn't done well. And that's one of the things I do is I fix the complications. And this is more of some surgical points. Uh, but the key thing is that the compression bandage dressing, if it's if it's um, if it's used, is removed on the first or second post-op day, and minimal to no bruising. Anyway, this is Dr. Epstein, one of my favorite places in the world, the beautiful coast of Croatia, by Dubrovnik. So that is my scientific presentation. This is me. Um, I welcome any questions. Um, I, If you have a question, I see there's one question I have. When you do concomitant brow lift with your hairline lung surgery, how do you anchor your brow lift? Great, great question. Basically, they're saying if I'm doing the hairline lung surgery, if I'm doing the hairline lung surgery, and once I secure the hairline forward, then I take the brow lift and then that gets secured to the frontal hairline. So wherever it is, it's up here, whether it's done like this, whether it's done more up and out. So I can basically, by removing the excess skin and freeing up the deeper muscles, I can secure the brow lift to wherever is desired and have basically have very specific and exact control or quite not exact, but quite accurate control of where the eyebrows get placed. Anyway, I see another question, Katie, and I'm gonna allow you to answer your question. Go ahead, Katie. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Yes, I just had a question. It's a scar from a female, but do you mind to just show it again? Cause it zipped by um, fast. I'm sorry, you, you like, got um, that a post-op. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, a post-op surgical scar. So you know, you said like as long as you put the hair forward, nothing can be seen. I was just curious how, how can you do? You, can you show an up close picture of what the scar looks like um, after surgery? I guess, or yeah, maybe a month after. Um, but for most patients, by three four weeks, there's if, if they wear their hair back, there's there's no issues. But let me go ahead. Oh, Hang on a second. Okay. You there? Yeah. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yes. Do you hear me? For some reason, I'm having a hard time. Uh, oh, no. Do you hear? I'm here. No, I know. You're here. Oh. <laughs> um, um, but I'm finding... Um, I've lost... Um, let me see one second. I'm just having a hard time. I've lost my... My Zoom memory. Here we go. Okay, good. So let me share my screen again. I apologize. No problem. Um, so let me show you. Well, here's eight months after. Okay. Okay, wow. Here is probably six months later. Okay. Another example. So in most cases, and I'm not going to say every scar is perfect, uh -huh. but in the overwhelming majority of my patients, the scar is barely, if at all, detectable as soon as six to eight weeks later. Here's one where, if you look closely, there's a little bit of a white line there, mm -hmm. but essentially, um, that's, that's typically what the scar is. But I always tell my patients, you know, every patient's different. Right. And I can't guarantee that you know, every you're going to have a perfect scar, but mm -hmm. even if the scar doesn't heal up 
at, so at, at, or it heals to leave any visibility, mm -hmm. it can always be addressed with grafting, which is the nice, the nice thing. But I don't typically have to redo my incisions. Okay. They tend to heal up quite well. Perfect. Okay. Uh, that's, I got your question. I see was that, that answered your question, Katie. Yes. I, I have one more question on the brow lift. Is that what pulls up falling eyelids? Is that what the brow lift does? Yeah. Brow lift is actually, it's, it's, it's partially uh, descriptive when you say it's a brow lift. It's actually forehead contouring surgery. Okay. And it's, it's not the bony area, but it basically allows the eyebrows um, to be in their desired position without requiring the, the elevation of the um without requiring the elevation of the of the foreheads of the of the eyebrows themselves so it allows for like a casual or at I rest uh, ideal placement or position of the eyebrows but yes it can also be done to change the shape and to give a more open eye uh, okay okay cool yeah i've got a fallen eyelid so that, that that now it's three birds with one stone okay thank you so much you're very welcome um, any other questions before I finish up? Cool. Great. It's been a real pleasure. Um, always happy to take a couple of minutes in my, in this case, a Monday late afternoon and educate a group of people. Um, if there's any questions, I encourage you to, you know, go to my website, www.drjeffreyepstein.com. That's D-R-J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-E-P-S-T-E-I-N.com. Um, and I'm quite communicate, communicative with my patients, always happy to answer questions, provide guidance. I have two wonderful patient advisors who are, also have a couple of assistants. So we really try to make our patients feel well taken care of, even if they don't come in for a consult, meet me on the morning of surgery. And, um, and all the surgeries are done in my office, which is where I've been doing them for years and years. Anyway, once again, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I wish you all a um, wonderful evening.